Welcome back to This Is Hardcore Podcast. You just heard Will To Live. This is the second track off the therapy sessions which they're promoting. This one's entitled Cold Embrace. Um, you can go all the way back, check out our episode with Rob from Will To Live. Houston's finest hardcore returning with a new release called Therapy Sessions. Hopefully they make their way out in the Northeast by the end of this year or maybe even next year. We've got a busy week coming up in Philadelphia. Um, today is Friday. There will be an announcement on the This Is Hardcore social media is around 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And because I record this before that, I don't want to drop it and then it gets on the internet beforehand. But it's some big news for us from the festival. And then, uh, yeah, tomorrow, Saturday, May 20th. Kenilworth VFW, Mind Force, NEG, Bulldoze, Pain of Truth, Gridiron, Shackled, Missing Link, Hold My Own, Negative Force. Uh, this show only holds about 400-something people. I think he sold almost 200 tickets already. You're not going to want to miss this. Um, Sunday, the following day, May 21st, Hard Times Flea Market with no, uh, no pressure at Underground Arts. The show sold out at nighttime. And then um, May 27th, Fool's Game, Pain Clinic, Deal with God, Fire and Blood, the Mieta VFW, also bankrupt is playing. And then um, Bob Wilson has Brain Tourniquet, Killing Pace, X Nomad X at Bonks, July, uh, June 2nd. And I've got Sansugabog, Jarhead, Fertilizer, Stabbed at Underground Arts, June 2nd. We also have June 23rd, which is Incendiary, Scarab, uh, Volcano, which is one of the members from Sansugabog. And Simulacra at Underground Arts. That show has only like 200 tickets left as well. Drain June 9th is completely sold out. And the show that I've been talking about, we're going to have a flyer out, be handing out Saturday, May 20th. Yeah, May 20th. This is the benefit for Kev1 Bulldoze. Bulldoze, Shout Out Realm, Freight Train, Shout Out from PA, All Shall Suffer, which is members of Denied. They were very close to Kevin. Denied. Kevin put them out on Time Serve Records, um, Bayway, and more. That's Saturday, June 24th. That's going to be a matinee. We have shows going into July now. It's incredible. Obviously, This Is Hardcore is August 4, 5, and 6. Um, yeah. Philadelphia Hardcore Show is pretty simple to follow us. P- PhillyHCShows.com. PhillyHCShows on Instagram and Twitter. This Is Hardcore Fest on Instagram. T-I-H-C Fest on Twitter. And um, yeah. Things have been kind of interesting for Hardcore. Discovered Mag came in strong. Everybody liked it. Very glossy, very professional. And then the kind of train fell off the tracks because socially some people didn't behave correctly. And, you know, for me, I really don't care how the fuck it happened or why the fuck it happened because it really doesn't affect anything that I do. Um, But what I really don't like is when the people that were jumping in front of a camera or dying to get into the pages of a magazine are instantly on the other side of the equation when they wrap up on Twitter celebrating and blah, 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 and good riddance and all this stuff. And I don't know. Maybe I'm getting old. I think it's cheesy. Uh, If you cap people up that you don't know and jump in front of cameras just to get your band more publicity, don't be surprised if down the line the people that just popped out of nowhere are not as reputable as they should be. And again, this is not towards Discovered. This is towards everybody in general. I I find that besides No Echo, in effect, and a lot of the longstanding people that have been involved in hardcore promoting the culture are not to be trusted. And, you know, there's good and bad in getting press, but a lot of the bands that chase press today... They don't, they don't excite me. They're not the band that makes me go, oh my God, this is so cool. This band is in this magazine or some dickheads writing about them. It, it fucking means nothing to me. I'm more impressed with the young kid whose band uh, is playing three states away from where they live within the first six months. They don't have parents paying for everything. They don't have a manager. They don't have a booking agent. They just got brass set of balls and the fucking will to get outside of their hometown and make it happen. And I think that that's where... You know, the, the 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 fucking fork in the road is. There's tons of people dying to jump in front of a camera, dying to get viral, dying to get the blue checks. Not enough people trying to get their asses in a van and just make it fucking happen. The long, hard 
way, but the surest fucking way. It's the old school way, you know, and if Black Flag did it, anyone else can fucking do it. And that's that's my opinion on that matter. Um, today's episode, my guest is Adam from Orthodox. This is where people are, who the fuck is Orthodox? If you're not really following the metallic shit over the last 10 years, you may have not been aware of this guy. Rest assured, his story is pretty fucking awesome. Comes from Nashville, Tennessee, and as a um, big fan of Memphis, Tennessee, and big fan of Tennessee in general, it was interesting to hear a different perspective from a couple years later on his opinion in hardcore in Nashville. And his story is great. He's another kid who's out there trying to grind it, make it happen. Um, very eloquent speaker. Uh, has his head squared right away. Very professional person. And, you know, learning what he does for a living and seeing his what he does, it makes sense how, how well he holds himself. And again, this is another one of these conversations I had coming home from the nuke plant. Eyes rolling in the back of my head and being like, fuck. Got to record a podcast, so my my words are like, oh. <laughs> so my apologies to Adam for not being 100% on point. Yet again, this is a cool conversation. Orthodox is playing Friday, August 4th at this hardcore. That shit is sold out. But guess what? You can check out Orthodox because they play all the time, and they'll be coming through. And although this is a band that necessarily to say, not necessarily to say, but I'll say that, I don't think that I would put on Orthodox and listen to in the car ride and be like, this is the greatest shit on earth. Or if someone played me an Orthodox song, I could know off the bat if it is them. They are a band that is growing by pure principle of busting their ass, pushing themselves, and going on the fucking road. He books tons of shows in his own area, and that's the kind of stuff that helps you in a band situation get reciprocation. You know, like, hey, if you can help somebody out in your hometown, it's going to be easier for you when you're out on the road. And I think sonically, the music might be not exactly what uh, Ray B's would call hardcore, but in the same rate, a lot of what that, that this band has done and what this man has to say is completely aligned with everything in the hardcore world. And it was a cool conversation to have. And over the course of this podcast, I think that you will enjoy listening to a different perspective, and also see so many similarities, even though you may not be familiar with some of the bands that he's talking about. So, let's fucking go. <clears throat> Welcome to This Is Hardcore Podcast, Adam Easterling, Nashville's own. Orthodox is playing This Is Hardcore, probably on one of the cool, if I was a young band coming through, coming up, and I could play something with the list of heroes on the Friday night, I think I would be fucking elated. And um, Orthodox has come through Philly a couple of times. We've been lucky to book them. But this is the first time I think me and you are really going to have a real chit-chat here, young man. And I'm just happy that you're a part of the fest, and I'm happy that we're having you on the show. Yeah, man. Uh, Super excited to chat. Super excited to be on the fest. Uh, To your point of the the lineup for that night, I mean, our uh, when I got the call from our manager, good old, Carl Severson, he uh, he calls you like, hey, uh, just got the phone with Joe. He wants to put you guys on a on the first night with integrity and Earth Crisis. And I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, we're amped. It's uh, we're always the oddball, so we're always always ready for that. But us being a, a weird straight edge band playing with like the original weird straight edge band is kind of great. So we're in. I like the continuity between what you guys are doing now and what those guys did then. And I think it blends well. well. Uh, we're going to take you all the way back because I'm representing my boys in clenched fist. Okay. Tennessee zone. And uh, oh yeah, uh, I played Nashville, but the last time I played there, it was when everybody wore really tight pants with them goofball studded belts. And everybody had that kind of flippy goofball ass hair, like they were either was, in the Jetsons or the some weird Beatles thing. So, oh yeah, I was um, there. I was yeah. in it. <laughs> so I have no, I have no idea about the modern Nashville hardcore scene, and mm-hmm. but I read a little bit in the last week or so once we knew we were doing this podcast about your personal life and how it reflects. So I think it's good we take it all the way back to when you first started absorbing music and what your family life was like. Man, uh, absorbing music for me 
is like core memory because my family actually was in the country music industry. It's like how my parents met. Um, so, I mean, one of the first memories I have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Joe Diffie, but uh, my parents actually discovered him on a demo tape forever ago. I mean, God, probably late eighties, early nineties. And the story is basically that my mom or my dad, one was, was listening to some demo, some person was playing and said, man, I hate that song, but who's the singer. And they're like, Oh, it's Joe Diffie. And they called him up. And I, I think, like I said, core memory for me is going backstage. And I think it was the Ryman auditorium or Grand Ole Opry one. And like singing one of his songs to him when I was like two or three years old. So Holy I, shit. yeah, literally goes as far back as I can possibly remember. But um, I'd say for heavy music, the turning point for me was probably the Tony Hawk pro skater soundtracks. You're not the um, first person to say that on this episode. Yeah, man. Podcast, which blows my mind because I didn't really play it that much. Yeah. But I remember people rocking out. Um, and it's just kind of surreal that it feels like your generation and a couple of generations before you, that was the exposure point. What was the track that really stood out for you back then? Man, Gorilla Radio from Raging Against Machine was on the original. And well, yeah, I think it was either Gorilla Radio or, or Testify one was on on the on either the first or second one. And uh Superman by Goldfinger. I mean, that was like Okay. It's not heavy music, but alternative music. That was like the song. Um those really stood out. And then I, I want to say it was Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 is where they had the Anthrax. Um, it was, don't is it Don't Sweat the Technique, but it's an Anthrax song playing in the background or something like that. It's just, from there, it was, it was you know, every song, every, every game got a more expanded soundtrack. And then Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 is like where I heard System of a Down for the first time. And that's like, that's my favorite band. So that that's where I kind of attribute what that happening around the same time as MySpace happening to where I could actually go in and really find all this music on my own. Cause Tennessee radio wasn't super metal focused and my parents were pretty Christian growing up. So they didn't really want me listening to it. Um, I've said, I was actually going to, I was actually going to delve into that. Cause I feel as if the Bible belt, Nashville, you're, you get away with listening to country, Cause it's, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the background music of the area, mm-hmm. but also because of the Christian values and the restrictive nature of some different churches, depending if you're a seventh day Adventist or Pentecostal, depending mm-hmm. on where you're at, you might be really restricted, not only as a young kid, but just in general to what you're even exposed to. So with, even though the pair were your parents, Duly involved in country music while also being quite religiously restricted. When is that exactly what's happening here? Yeah, I think it was. It wasn't even necessarily religiously restricted because we weren't like every week churchgoers. But my family has a big Southern Baptist family, and so it was kind of like they were trying to, I think, up uphold the morals of my grandparents and so on. Um, but yeah, it was. It was really it's just funny that the way that I would be able to get away with getting records was like, I would have to go find a website that had the lyrics of an album. And then my mom would read through the lyrics and make sure it was okay. And that's how, once you finally started letting me listen to like heavy music and so on, that's how I was able, I mean, if it weren't for Lincoln park, not cussing and slip, not releasing volume three, that doesn't have anything uh, super explicit on it. I don't know that I would have ever gotten to really dive in like I wanted, but even to that point, I was downloading songs illegally and naming them different artists on my iTunes so that I could get away with listening to it. So it was weird support because I didn't understand it. But I think what also helped was that Nashville was if do you remember that that tour Scream the Prayer? No, not I mean, I'm going to I'm going to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. When I when I heard Orthodox for the first time, I didn't know what to think. Because so many young kids just go and listen to old music and demos mm-hmm. and they try to make their entire personality around this shit. So mm-hmm. I never take it as anything genuine. I think it's like, it's just like, a, oh, here's a gimmick that no one's tried to use, like wrestling. Like, no one's done the Hawaiian gimmick. Let's have a tag team that's Hawaiian yeah. or something. And I, so I, I, I wrongly attributed it to the new metal stuff to you guys. And then I read more for this podcast and realized you were kind of immersed in it just by the nature of what we're talking about now, that that was like 
the few things that you would really be able to expose to. Then I was like, oh, yeah, because he's from like the fucking Bible Belt. So mm-hmm. there really wasn't the same access to the kill your mother and rape everybody, destroy thing world that everybody else was kind of able to get to. Yeah. And also, really, you were talking about the the tight jean studded belt and such like around the time I started going to shows, the hardcore scene here was, was not not I was gonna, mega I was gonna popular. Work my, I was going to work my way up to that because I, I know yeah. a lot of people on these podcast. No one starts uh, listening to Chromax. And I mean, I'll tell you yeah. what, uh, I have a daughter who's in her mid to late 20s. And uh, yeah, that shit was around in her. That shit was around her her whole life. But if she was ever on a podcast, I wouldn't, it'd be harder to be like, oh, yeah, my dad also listened to all these other things. But I think it's the exposure not to the hardcore stuff first. It's the other stuff that kind of almost makes the pendulum swing. Like you, you said you had the country music over here. So when you hear this other stuff, of course, it's going to gravitate and attract you more because of mm-hmm. everything your parents aren't into. Yeah, you know I mean, so I think if you grew up with this shit right in front of you, you may not be as willing to be um, connected to it because you're like, oh, this is I don't like this. I want to do my own thing. But uh, back to what you're saying, yeah. what was up with that tour? Why did you reference that? Oh, just because it was it was. Uh, so there was this big tour back in the day that was all Christian metalcore, and it was like at eight to 14 band massive tour every, and it would always start in Nashville day one. And I think it was because of tours like that and venues, like we had a venue here called rocket town, which is like a Christian venue. And because a lot of that catered to the religious morals, my parents were trying to keep me in line with that's kind of what made them comfortable with dropping me off at these shows where it's all music. They don't understand, but they're like, well, at least it's a good message. So on and so forth. Uh, meanwhile, I'm getting my absolute ass kicked to bands like impending doom and things like that. But you know, that that's like what made them comfortable, at least leaving me there so that I could then be as tours went on, I would all like, there was, especially in the Southeast, always some band at that point that was like a, a Christian or positive band on any, t- any given tour. And so at that, I was able to at least pinpoint, Oh, I want to go see this band. And then I get, get away with going to see, all these other bands that were a part of the act. And that's kind of like what opened the door to being able to see all the things that I did and really get me going to shows to the point where eventually they were comfortable enough with me going that they didn't need to know who was playing. And that's kind of how I then started playing my own music with it. And then down the line, here we are, you know, I, I'm the, one of the promoters for the Nashville hardcore scene here. I've been playing in this band and touring for 10 years and, uh, I really don't know it, as, as little of that stuff as I, you know, align to now, I don't know that I would be where I am without it. So it's kind of like a, a weird, I guess I owe it some weird nostalgic credit to that kind of odd niche part of the genre of that time to be, to me being able to be where I am now. So we had this thing I talked about a couple of times. Um, so for records, Sky Bob was a, uh, Louis Sofa Bob Records, and uh, he did a couple of shows in the neighborhoods that we're from. And uh, there's a band that was Christian from our f- area called Pink Daffodils. They had one of the early, like, female fronted, but with the metallic guitar stuff. Uh, 121 were dudes that are like from the area, but so they called it Philadelphia. I don't actually even know if they're from the city, but because those bands were in the area, there were shows like you're talking about here, but they were in church halls. And there were kids a lot like you where because it was uh they would call it like um not faith driven but spirit spirit hardcore and spirit stuff like filled that. yep spirit filled hardcore and you see that on the shirts that that was the introduction to that world but because of we live in Pennsylvania we have the greatest Christian hardcore band of all time disciple and um we became very good yeah, friends baby. with the, we became very good friends with those dudes and. NIV played here many years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. and Punishment and Shadow Run both got to play with NIV. We got I got a really good taste of the the hardcore end of the Spirit Field stuff. Uh, as we were touring and as I got older, I always felt it bizarre that like on one hand you had the Christian metalcore, which is his own little kind of like a battle of good and evil, but then they're at Warp Tour and all the bands are getting called out for hooking up with young girls and <laughs> there's a lot of surreality of like. Yeah, yeah that really that really didn't work out too well for you. <laughs> no. 
Yeah, I think there's a reason that genre is not flourishing like it did at one point. I think it's it's also the ironic part is how big of a cash grab it became to where bands were just claiming to believe in this kind of stuff and literally performing based on what other bands did to just be able to be into that scene because like, well, we, we're not making in all these fields. We may as well jump into the Christian field and make a bunch of money out of that way. And it was, I, I think that's why it crashed so hard is because the the morals it stood on just were not there. So it's a weird thing, right? So look back to the, the, time when i'm talking about full um figure four from canada was christian but when they released comeback kid the first thing came out Mm -hmm. and the faith-based so they had a huge audience immediately yep and then obviously as they shifted they kind of got into what we consider like not restricted to faith-based stuff they released records with different labels yada 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 but they kind of had a cheat code to immediately have a bigger crowd Immediately, mm-hmm. because those kids, just like you're talking about, it's good that you gave us a reference. Explain it's like comeback kid within the first record had hundreds of kids, which is not usual even for Canadian bands to know them yeah. off the bat. But because of the the faith based initiatives and the way that those kids could come to those shows, they got a little boost. And um, I actually saw it. I uh, the guys from Ocala, Florida. My buddy Drew Russ, he was in um, Seven Star. He did an awesome show for Punishment and Ringworm uh, ten, oh, shit, 20 years ago. Holy shit. 20, <laughs> 20 years ago, we go play this church in Ocala, Florida. And they've got pizza. And the guy was like, I forgot he said something effective. Like, I know you guys are rockers. So if you're going to drink your beer, just keep it in the van, man. Like, yep. <laughs> don't bring it around the kids because it's Punishment. And we're all kids. And like, Obviously, ringworm are just like they're fucking old men with beards and smoke cigarettes and drink beer. So they're like, let's keep it over there. We know you guys are cool, though. <laughs> but playing those shows, honestly, for Punishment and Ringworm, that was one of the best shows we played in Florida. There was millions of kids. And, and, and so as I poke fun and stuff, I'll also equally say that some of the best shows that Punishment played were in Erie, Pennsylvania and um, in Indiana, where there were a lot of faith based kids. And you played I, the, the hatch in Evansville. Yeah, that's actually where yeah. we played. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. We played there. And, and the thing is, is so the resp- and obviously we played in um, some of the stuff in Southern California, not just in Showcase Theater, but other places a little bit further south. And because of uh, Jason Dunn from NIV, all being mm-hmm. from like El Zagundo and all the areas, like all those bands like there's band Cast and Stone. There's always bands from like 20 something years ago that mm-hmm. were good to put this for you. And then later to Punishment, we, we went with Shadow Realm. It's always a lot of cool people, and not this was those days like uh, no one is a victim. And Disciple played in Philadelphia the same mm-hmm. night, like Kid Dynamite and all these bands played in the, the other part of the city. And the moshing much was was much harder at Disciple and No One Is a Victim. Like you had to bring your fucking A game because you got to remember. And I would say this: Oh like, yeah, these Christian kids got one or two shows a month, maybe. So they're training. They're gonna kick the fucking Jesus out of you. So you oh, gotta be ready. Absolutely. It was great. Dude, well, that's that's kind of like the funny part. Like you're talking about it being <clears throat> some of the best shows you play. I feel like that can kind of attribute to, I think, a big part of the reason shows get, this is to speak also on like the Nashville hardcore scene is like when you're at like a Christian show of that time, there's no, con- there's not any tension. Everybody is like a part of the same community, no matter where you're from. So there's not anybody that's upset with anybody there. And so like, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want because everyone's just going to laugh it off, which is how it's supposed to go, you know? Yeah. And so when there's no worry that you're about to just hit, hit the wrong guy and get your absolute shit kicked in, it kind of like opens up the door of like, Oh, maybe I will try doing this absolutely ballistic thing that I shouldn't be doing kind of thing. And I think that's part of the reason why, I mean, especially no one is a victim like that. God, this part of the reason you have like such insane reactions. We're playing with, um, Furnace Fest this year, we're playing with what Blood Comes Cleansing, which was uh, a Christian deathcore band back in the day. Literally one of those bands that I recall distinctly, it was actually the Screen the Prayer tour. Their singer screams, every fat kid destroy a skinny kid. And <laughs> dude. That might be the boss call. <laughs> dude, oh, I wow. literally sit in there. Like you said, swoosh hair. I've got probably got my mom's jeans on at this point. And I literally get picked up by this dude. And he just runs across the room and throws me over these people's heads. And it was like, it was, 
hilarious, but it's like one of those things where even in the moment of me getting picked up, I'm like, oh, this is like what's supposed to happen here. And so I'm honestly, I'm very excited to see what the hell happens during this little reunion they're doing. But um, yeah, it's just, it, that's one of those weird things where even though it's the Christian message, I think people just felt so comfortable using it as, as a true form of expression that they just got away with so much more. No, I, I, and outlets are important. And I, you know, elderly Joe hardcore would say that, you know, um, I kind of go back and forth cause I have uh, insane amounts of religious tattoos on me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of waver from um, knowing historically, there's a, a lot of inaccuracies in the Bible to understanding without faith. I don't know what human beings do to not go, you know, the idea of a soul yeah. and all these things are interesting, but hardcore has a funny way of the, the dualities in these things. When you started hearing system of the down, you weren't going to hardcore shows though yet. Correct. Or you just going to Christian shows. I was not yet going to, well, I guess were you, I going don't to, know you were going to rock concerts. You weren't going to. No, honestly, yet. no, I wasn't you were that even, young. <clears throat> okay. Cool. I wasn't even, well, not even that. It's just that being that young, my parents had no interest in going, so they wouldn't have been able to take me. I don't think I started going until I was about 14. So maybe two to three years later, I, I think is when I started going. Now, with, when, with them being involved in the music business, you obviously went to a lot of uh, shows, though. You went to a lot of big country shows. Mm-hmm. How was that? Like, how was that experience? Was it because you had to go to your parents, something you didn't enjoy? Did you find, did you take anything from it? Like, where, like, what did that, where do you uh, land on that now looking back on it? I, I mean, here's the thing is I still love the country music of that era. I think a lot of the modern country music that comes out nowadays, that's like on the radio is genuine garbage. But uh, I think that back then when you're really getting like the first truly popular, like radio popular country artists of that era, I, I was very fortunate in being able to be so close to it. Um, like my mom signed uh, Kenny Chesney to his first publishing deal. My, they, they signed Tim McGraw to one of his first publishing deals. Keith Urban. Like there's some really big names that I was like, uh, do you know the Tim McGraw song? I like it. I love it. I know the song because I work on job sites and sometimes people yeah. play shit like that, especially so, when we're out on these new plant jobs. A lot of the the people from the South play it. So I know it from people's uh, pickup trucks, but I don't know the word lyrics. So my mom published that song. Like that's, she did that. She, they had a lot of really, really cool, big songs in the country music industry. So I got to be really close to something that I didn't realize how special it was at the time. And I think because I was so engulfed in it, like all of my family did it, my grandfather, my aunts and uncles, all of them. So it was kind of just a way of the family to where I enjoyed a lot of the music I was hearing. Um, And I wavered a little bit as I started to get more into the heavier stuff, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it. It was just not, um, there was something, there was something I think missing from my personal fulfillment of it. And I think that's what I found in the energy of like being at a heavy show for the first time. So that, that's kind of where the, it crossed and why it, the, the focus shifted so heavily when it did. So growing up in this very legit music family, did you, was it something you were drawn to or were you thinking more or less like because it was a business and all the chaos in your personal lives that you were something you were going to be um, not trying to be involved in? Because it sounds like the, the the depth in which your parents were involved in is pretty heavy to be a young kid around. It So I think being around it when I did lent me a lot of really realistic expectations for once I did actually start especially with Orthodox and playing and going out and so on. Um, I think I always was drawn to the idea of performing. I never knew how to, how I was going to do it. Cause I tried to pick up guitar and couldn't stick with it. Tried to pick up mandolin and couldn't stick with it. And then I got a drum set and I was like, Oh, I got a drum set around the same time that I discovered Joey Jordison. And so it was like swing the doors open and I was in ready to go. And that's when I really started trying to be the best musician that I could be. And trying to start bands as bad as some of them were. And uh, eventually it led to getting out and going on, um, going on a tour. Our first tour was, you know, 2013, actually the last show of that tour, we played with clinch fist oh, uh, shit. In, in Nashville. I just, it was clinch fist. 
uh, it was in at this place in Nashville. It was at a place called the Owl Farm back in the day. Oh, but okay. it was them and Criminal Instinct and us and another okay. local. But, uh, but yeah, it, it. I think it was never something that was really on the forefront because I was also super into sports growing up. Like I genuinely thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. And I think then, every I think every kid with an aggressive father thinks that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, and. I was, I was really good. We played on a, a, a team. Our, Brooks and Dunn actually sponsored our high school baseball team. God damn. And, yeah, and uh, it was it was cool. I made it onto the high school team, and right about that time is when the real interest in music Musical took over. Fuck up a jo- musical oh, fuck a jocks world. Hold doesn't on. it? Doesn't <laughs> it? And uh, that was when I realized how much I didn't fit in with that team and those people, and I started really leaning into, you know, what the metal scene at the time was. And uh, I, I don't even remember what you even asked me for me to get here. I do this way too often. Tangents so do I. It's, me, what, it's, it's what, it <laughs> doesn't matter. We're having a good conversation. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, essentially. Um, it, oh, it was back to, Oh yeah. Cause your mother, if, if your I, mother was involved in publishing and all that yeah. stuff. I, I think it, it lent me to answer the question is that once I, it, it, it it didn't push me away from it. I never had a real draw to it till I found the right music. And then once I did and I started getting out and doing things, my expectations of what could be accomplished and what I should be looking to get done were very realistic because I'd seen what the top of the charts and like the top of the mountain looked like. And I realized that like the top of the mountain I was climbing wasn't the same mountain. And Amen. Amen. I love, I love this already. Yeah, so oh, it, it, I think that kind of made me this Orthodox ate shit for a long time. Well, like we've I, been, like I said, we've been a band for over ten. It'll be ten years since our first tour this year, and we played so many bad shows for so long. But I think because I knew from the jump that this wasn't going to be a career per se, or at least I didn't expect it to be. I just enjoyed every minute of it, regardless, because that's just all I wanted to do, and it makes you know, the, the subtle victories of things like playing Furnace Fest, this is Hardcore Fest. Uh, tomorrow we announce our first headliner in five years. Like it's things like that, that make those victories so much sweeter because I'm, I've already done everything I set out to do. So everything now is just the sprinkle on top. Looking back, can you recall the first time you were at a non rock show, non Christian show? Like what was the first, like you would call like, a hard, a hardcore ish show for your area. First hardcore show. Hardcore ish. We got hard on ish. I mean, I I remember the actual first like well the first show with breakdowns was yeah. uh scary kids scaring kids uh Gwen Stacy drop dead gorgeous and haste the day. So a bunch of metalcore tight pant you know I'm aware of all the arms. I'm aware yeah. of oh, yeah. all the names because of MySpace and internet but mm-hmm. I you couldn't play a MySpace song. core. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and you know, some of those aged really well. Some of them aged like dog shit. It is what it is. But uh, so I'd say that was the first heavy show I went to. And I was like in right away. It's like, okay, got to be here as often as possible. Nashville, though, in Nashville proper. Mm -hmm. Yep. In in Rocket Town, downtown on Sixth Avenue South. Um, And the first actual hardcore show I went to was. Casey Jones and Hour of the Wolf. Oh, yeah. And okay. that was at a venue called The Anchor. Now, the, the exposure that I'd had to heavy music to this point was strictly between Rocket Town and this really just hole in the wall, dangerous venue called The Muse. Um, and they were true antithesis of one another. Rocket Town was clean, well kept. My friends were the staff. You had a good time. You moshed really hard, but nobody really, there was never any issues. The muse was nobody's in charge. So watch your fucking head. And then, <laughs> and I saw, you know, first time I went there, I saw Carnifex. Uh, I saw white chapel with suffocation. And we're talking about a room that is there. There was no business being more than 150 people in this room. And I'm talking three to 400 people crammed into this place. It was and it's all black everything, black stage, black floor, black center block walls. I mean, it was it. I had no business being there as a young teenager, straight up like I just did. But 
went to shows there. And then the first hardcore show I went to was literally in between the two. So they were both rocket town was on sixth Ave. The muse is on fourth Avenue and in between it, like could draw a line to it was the anchor, which was a church venue. But they did one thing that Rocket Town did not, which is they allowed stage diving. And Fuck so yeah. I got to see Casey Jones it was my first hardcore show. It was packed the fuck out and people were flying over my head. And that was I mean, I'd seen like local hardcore bands and could distinctly tell the difference, especially because back then hardcore was very punk. It wasn't yes. like now where it was. It's a lot of beat down and metal influences a lot more of like the punk hardcore like my favorite hardcore bands back then still are to this day is like trash talk you know that's like that's like the era that i came into is when they were really popular so that really fast punky hardcore stuff is what i was seeing and so to go from seeing the christian metalcore really slow heavy breakdowns to now i'm at a show that's 10 times crazier but it's nowhere near as heavy but for some reason it's a, it's way more violent. And like I said, people are just flying over my head. I was like, all right, this is something that I need to explore a little further. And that's kind of where instead of dipping a toe in, I was like, all right, when's the next thing that's going to happen. That's way bigger than that. Here's, here's one thing to show you how out of the hardcore scene I was when I started. And I've told this before, but at rocket town, there was a flyer for a show at the anchor. Now, were you ever familiar with the band Hollywood or love is red? Love is Red, we played shows with. Both Shadow Round Punishment played shows with Love is Red. So they had In fact, a dual, we played, like, we were on a eulogy tour. I think Love is Red supported that Nashville show we played. Okay. That so they good. were an Alabama band that played Nashville all the time. Yeah. But I'd never seen them. I'd never seen Hollywood, which was like the Nashville hardcore band of that era. They were both breaking up in the same night for a show at the Anchor. The undercard consisted of have heart. Uh, I want to say verse. Maybe I know foundation opened and I think Bane was even on the show. I knew who none of these bands were. I saw a Marilyn Monroe head on the flyer and I'm so used to like five word band names that instead of going to that show, I went and saw X Bishop X down the road at the muse because I was like, Oh, that's a metal show. Damn, you I had no clue what this Hollywood show do. Oh, did I? I see videos of that shit now, and I'm like, "Wow, I was such a fucking idiot." Like that was probably no disrespect uh, that to was Bishop, probably but. A, that was probably 06 because there was some tours around that time, or maybe 07, something like that, somewhere in that area. Yeah, that's I think that's right. around that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, I, I think um, the hard thing for me is that I've never had I had that moment with the Memphis people, but I knew when you minute you get down south, things are a little different. Um, mm-hmm. George has always been very punk rock. Carolina's always had a lot of skinhead shit. We know a lot of them dudes. So when that metal stuff was happening, we were touring and punishment didn't really have, we weren't good enough to have a place in the hardcore ethos, but we toured everywhere, which meant we played. I hate, you know what? Let's talk about this. I hate the term flyover. It's really dismissive because it's like, you know, yeah, it's easy now to fly out and play these shows in the known cities because of the internet, but before all that, man, yeah, you did have to drive nine fucking hours. You had to drive nine hours from Virginia to Nashville, and you're gonna play that show to fifty people that may not know who the fuck you are. So I, I feel to to quote these kids, I feel like um, the uh, the modern day term has able has has an ableist thing to avoid having to play the all the shitty towns or not shitty towns, but the ones that, that don't the don't have this. Yeah, I want to say C market like. Yeah, not every not every Nashville or even the town next to Nashville is going to have a fucking mad ball. But touring and learning these things, some of them shows on the Tuesdays and Wednesday nights because those kids had nothing, whether it was in fucking Nashville or we would play in Nebraska and we played Wyoming. Like we played some wild shit because we didn't have an oh, agent. Yeah. And there wasn't really that stuff out there. I always felt sometimes it's a hit and jump, sometimes it's a complete L. But it's worth doing. And so the flyover idea really got, kind of gets on my ass. I think also when, by today's standards, 2023, the bands you're talking about could equally be mocked like LOL. It's like, yeah, not guess who didn't? I mean, guess who didn't play down there a lot? Madball. Guess who didn't play down there a lot? Agnostic Front. You know, it's going to be harder for kids when the bands aren't traveling down there 
to see mm-hmm. those kind of hardcore shows. So, oh, I'll dude, put- I just booked Madball in Nashville for the first, their first show in Nashville was yeah. last year. 25 years as a band, it's their first time in Nashville. So, yeah, it, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it, it will, it, it just becomes one of these things where the small towns have their own cultures and we're missing that now in hardcore because everybody listens to Spotify, everyone listens to Bandcamp and Twitter. Twitter is it's, I don't care if it doesn't, <laughs> I blame Twitter for everything because it's homogenized so much stuff. So you could be some kid from Alabama and your favorite band is going to be any G instead of being some Alabama, the band that we don't know who the fuck they were. So I kind of, I kind of hit there. It no is. cure. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> they actually, I, I pull up every once in a while. I pull up old Excel sheets that I made for hardcore mm-hmm. submissions, like hardcore, this hardcore submissions just mm-hmm. to see some of the shit. And they actually, I remember them being like, check us out. I still love checking out bands from all over. And one day I want to have the patience to do like a 25 bands you've never heard of. And let's listen to the song and talk about it podcast. Cause there's so many bands that just don't tour and don't get the same traction. That'd be yeah. kind of cool. Um, so back to your story. Now you're, now you're ripping and rolling. You got your, you got your little bit of hardcore trajectory, but did you, what was your first band that you can recall playing in? First band I could recall playing in. Yeah. Like, was like how a... long, what was the gap between that? Like, when you started going to, you decided to start playing. So I started playing shows when I was 15 in a really bad Christian deathcore band. And our first show was actually at my church. Uh, and I booked it. It was actually very packed, but uh, we played with this power pop band called since forever. And um it was, it was, that was like the first real taste of like, holy shit, that was a rush because I was like, I can't believe people are moshing to my band. What is this? And, you know, you don't see a video of yourself that much back in 2000 and whatever year it was, six, seven, eight, whenever it might have been. And so we had no idea how bad we were because no, nobody had cameras on their phones back then. So we were just playing these shows, having a great time. And I look back, I'm like, man, that was you kind of earn your stripes through playing through those really rough bands. And we were one of those really rough ones, but I would say 15 years old is when I started playing that. And then once that band disbanded, we started playing in a hardcore band that was heavily influenced by like, uh, you could get in trouble for saying it now, but very, very influenced by like champion and, um, you know, half hard oh, verse. We, we've and then champion, like, we've had champion on the pod. I've had a random champion on the podcast. Or, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to let the, one of my really good buddies is Chris Williams from champion. Mm-hmm. And he's probably one of the most wholesome, solid people in hardcore. So someone saying you're not allowed to listen to champion. One of the greatest dudes in the history of hardcore, to my opinion, is Chris Williams. So we're, I'm protect, I'm protecting champion. Fuck there we champion. go. <laughs> also, here's the other caveat is everybody who went after Jim champion. When we were younger, everybody the same way, homeboy from expire who got canceled it's always mm-hmm. the dudes and, and the same thing for the home record dudes there's always these people that are a little off and people like we don't fuck with them like he's so great he's so great the sun shines out of his ass and then it gets canceled and it was like you can't listen to him it's like motherfucker we never listened to that why i, I fucked with champion heart way early on because chris is my boy did punishment shows and jim was always being a fucking goofball I don't know. I heard about the expire uh, point system thing way back in the day. I thought that was fucking man goofy. So yeah, let's, 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 we're going to, we're not gonna let anybody say you can't you carry on from that, but <laughs> you can't not, <laughs> especially that song. You that uh, the early shit. They have that EP come out swinging. It was pretty dope. Continue. Yeah. But yeah, we bands like that, I would say actually maybe even more so than them was we, we, down the line, the band really drew from like dead swans and like the darker side of like melodic hardcore type stuff. But um, from there, uh, I was probably, gosh, 17, 16, 17 at that point and um, was pretty full swinging to go into shows every weekend, no matter what the show was. I just wanted to be at a venue with like minded folks because my high school was nothing like it. And uh, that was kind of just where I found the, the solace point pretty much. What were your parents thinking? Didn't get it, but I think they saw that I was 
at least talent. They, they I, I would say that I was pretty decent at drums for some of my age and they were just excited that I was doing anything with music. They didn't really understand it, but they supported it. I'd say that's even still to this day. I think my mom's full fledged wears my merch all the time. Uh, I still don't think my dad gets it, but he's, he's pretty blown away by the performance aspect of it at this point. So. Well, what I wonder is, is like, did they ever steer you be like, you're never going to make a career of this or were they just happy? Because obviously they were career minded. So I wonder if they kind of overlaid their own profession into what you had going on at that time. I think. At that point, it didn't really matter to them all too much because I was still in high school. And I think they, you know, the whole it's not a phase thing. I think they genuinely thought it was a phase. Uh, And, you know, that's kind of the joke I've brought up a few times is like, yeah, it's the phase that turned into a career. Uh, But it. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't they never gave really any pushback. Uh, It's kind of weird how it shifted once they got divorced um, to just being happy that I'm happy and not really, they kind of got a lot less strict at that point on both sides of just like, Hey, you know, they both knew I was straight edge. They both knew that I wasn't running with that crowd and getting into that kind of trouble. So they just weren't really all that concerned. And they were kind of like, if this is if being a part of this music scene is the worst thing you do, then that's a pretty good worst thing. Well, I wonder if, I know I read the different things about the background of your family. I'll let you talk on that. But like, I know that the divorce probably had a way heavily on you. I know their personal habits had to kind of influence you to stay straight edge. And I wonder in a, in a country town, I remember going to the South and I felt like every person in the South just smoked cigarettes inside of everything. So back then, yeah, (laughs) it, it probably, it probably had to give you a little bit of punk rock points to be like, fuck you, I'm not going to drink and all this stuff, correct? Or was um was that your initial uh, reason for being straight edge? I think there's so many things that happens when you're that happen when you're a kid that you don't realize how strongly they impact you because just in that moment your brain is just rolling and it's like, all right, this just happened. What uh, what are we doing to? move on. What are we doing to move past this, get on to the next thing? And you don't realize how heavy it weighs on you. So I never had, and still have never had any real draw to the idea of using any substances. It's never been something that appealed to me to begin with. And I think it's, it's probably subliminally tied to just darker memories I had of instances where family members were inebriated and so on. And in terms of being straight edge, it was kind of, it ironically was just a, I was talking with my bandmates in that shitty Christian deathcore band and they, they all smoked weed and they're like, do you want to smoke? I was like, no, I don't do any of that stuff. Like, Oh, so you're straight edge. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but what is it? And we, I think I looked it up on Wikipedia and that was like the day where I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. I'm straight edge. And I kind of just stuck to it and really started diving into looking into it more, and that's what kind of what I was claiming actually by the time that I went to that Casey Jones show. Uh, so they were also the first, like at, uh, for the time, big straight edge band I got to see. And it was a pretty cool sense of belonging in that too. And so I think having my already decisive personality to not want to get involved in the things that I'd watched kind of destroy my household mixed with the sense of belonging and the cultural influence of straight edge itself is kind of what kept me on it for kept me onto it so heavily at such a young age before I even really had any, before you could even be old enough to buy cigarettes and lottery tickets. I was already very much like, I'm never going to fucking do that. And then that's what everybody says. And they're like, Oh, when you're 21, it'll change. And 21 came around. I was like, no, that shit still sucks. (laughs) So it, it, it's one of those things that definitely influenced me to stay away from it, but I don't think it ever, I ever realized it at the time that that was the reason. I think it was just a back of my mind, this, this shit sucks. Don't do it. And then front of my mind was straight edge is sick. Stick with it. And that's kind of where it led me. So lead me through where Nashville goes from being the belts, the pyramid things on them and the hair 
slightly into where your next couple bands are going and how you see natural hardcore shifting as we go along in this story. So Nashville at one point had a, had a, what was really cool about that rocket town venue that I was talking about is that a lot of the people who ran the venue were younger people, not younger, but mid twenties people that were in the scene. So my good friend, um, Wes Breedwell was like the venue manager at the time. And he sang in a band from here called Alcina, which was another, you know, positive metalcore band. There was a band called As Hell Retreats that was from here. There was a band called A Fleet for Purging, um, which is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated heavy bands of our generation because they were just so nuts. But they were all a part of this big movement um, in Nashville to where our local shows were being put in like the main venue of Rocket Town, which was like a seven, 800 cap room. And that was happening every other month. They had a different holiday fest where 15 to 30 local bands played the small stage, the cafe stage and the main stage in Rocket Town. Damn. And you would just, you'd have hundreds of people there for these local bands. And I think that's what drove that to be such a strong scene and why everyone was in on that. Like, like you said, swooshy hair, Soda belt, you know, scene metal was because that's what our local scene kind of was built on and was thriving so well that like you not only saw these bands that you thought were on top of the world, but then you also got to just like hang out with them because they were just a part of the crowd. And so then all those bands break up and then Wes gets fired from Rocket Town for wearing an I support same sex marriage shirt. So Rocket Town gets pretty much blackballed at this point. And this is when hardcore is becoming a little more popular as it goes along. We've already, we had a venue here called the little Hamilton. Um, we had a venue, uh, the muse kind of stopped doing shows. So the anchor picked up more stuff, the end, which is now where I book all of our shows. Um, when I say our, I, I book all of AM PM shows at started picking up hardcore shows and that community started to thrive a little more because I think hardcore as a whole started taking in, started coming into the Southeast a little more. What bands and are we talking about are coming through? All sorts. I mean, I saw the Mongoloids like seven times. Everybody um, saw the Mongoloids seven times, and Greg's a <laughs> motherfucker for that. Oh, yeah. I, he's he's the singer of my other little side project thing called Youth Collapse, and he, he <laughs> that dude is a Motherfuckers trip. Motherfucker's in too, so many bands. He I really him. is. I'm, I love him. He's like a little brother to me, and I hate how many bands he's been in. <laughs> but so <laughs> mongoloids was one um comeback kid came through a handful of times you know casey jones always made this a stopping point because they're coming out of florida um to think back on like all i mean i saw trapped under ice and bane when they toured together um really I, that's good that enough point, I, that's yeah a good, there's that's a good that's a good landmark so people listen and go okay that's at this time in hardcore yeah, exactly. It was, you know, 2014, 2015, and actually really 2012 through 2015 yeah, was, was yeah. that era. And um, so all of this is now becoming more and more common where we're having these hardcore shows and like actual hardcore bands. And that's what's really pushing the scene on is because now all the bands in Nashville are not this scene metal thing. It's like studded belt, skinny jeans playing punk music instead. Which but the dudes who used to wear the belts, would they come into the shows all fat and old with the belts and shit on? Not all Probably of them. Not. A lot of them dropped off. But, <laughs> uh, you know, went out with the old in with the new is usually how it goes. So it's Nashville has always been a pretty young scene. You've always had the same group that stick around, but it's usually a very like young, a younger scene for the most part. And I think that also, again, has a lot to do with the fact that we had an all ages venue. And with that, uh, you know, all these other, another big wave was like, and Nashville had a really good, like indie alternative rock scene, kind of like PA had title fight balance, composure, super heaven. Um, all those bands were big influences on a lot of the metalcore, hardcore kids in Nashville. So we had all sorts of bands. We had, um, I played drums in a band called Daisy head for a minute. Uh, there's better off, um, Gosh, I mentioned how many there were, and now I can think of two, and that's about it. But had had a lot of really good like alternative bands kind of mixing in at the same wave as the hardcore bands. And uh, 
that's kind of what just eventually took over because I think around that time, really the scene metal stuff sort of died. You still had the real big ones like Devil Wears Prada and things like that, but there wasn't, and still really isn't much of like a touring small level deathcore market. And that's kind of where that stopped. Yeah. I've always wondered what, what a scene like shifts. And it seems like, there really isn't that Nash. Has there ever been that Nashville band to draw people in post that metal thing? Or like, can you think of like the, the ones in that area that were really chicken ass that people would even know? Man, I, that's the weird thing is that I would say Nashville local bands are better than a lot of touring bands, but really in terms of touring, it's only been us and chamber. That's really been like the only two bands that have really gotten out and like done the shit in terms of like the hardcore scene. Billy's a lot the same way. We had some dope bands, but they never really tour. Blacklisted yeah. being Blacklisted being an outlier, Mother of Mercy before that punishment. Um, Kid Dynamite did a handful of tours, not much. Paint It Black mm-hmm. did a handful of tours, not much. It's a bizarre world where sometimes the places with great shows, the local bands kill it, but there's not like this giant. You know, I mean, right now, I think Blacklisted could probably play after Hatebreed at this point because so many kids haven't seen them, you know, yeah. but um, I've always known Nashville to be obviously a music city for a lot of reasons. And, I, and the more and more you see it on Twitter, you see it on social media, people being like Nashville, is some of the best shows we played. Um, And then this kind of gets into where you guys start playing at a time right before. It's like code starting to really get somewhere and you guys start coming out. And I don't know which one is first, but I feel like the emergence of code orange really. Code, okay. Code orange. Yeah. Yeah. The mo the, 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 really the, the, the growth of code orange. I mean, I was, I always tell everybody the same thing. The code orange twitch and tongues tour of 2014. We did a show there. And I think I was one of like 20 people that I knew and I didn't know anybody in the room. And I'm like, Oh fuck, we're in a new hardcore era now. And I and I I remember seeing the Orthodox name for the last 10 years. And I feel like you guys kind of came along this wave of hardcore bands who were fixated to varying degrees in being in the hardcore scene and playing hardcore shows, but adding those touches of those metallic tinctures and those different chords and the um, having the affinity for the late nineties, new metal shit. And I wonder if you could talk about how you decided to do the band and infuse all this shit into your look and sound. So uh, to your note about the code orange twitching tongue show, we played that in Nashville. It was fucking mayhem. Literally. I think that it, that code orange record and that twitching tongues record, both just dumped people on their heads because both bands were known as hardcore bands. And suddenly it's like, those are the heaviest things that came out that year anywhere, you know? And we, as a band, our biggest influence when Orthodox started was actually foundation. Um, Our like early, early releases basically was super fast foundation songs. Cause I was still mega into, you know, bands like mountain man and trash talk and all that, like real threat, not even thrashy, but chaotic fast. Hardcore was like still my thing. And, but foundation was like one of my favorite bands. And so we really sounded, like I said, like a, like a fast foundation when we first started. And then second EP rolls around, we have a different guitarist in there and we started writing some stuff. They're like, Oh, this, you know, this would be really cool if we added this kind of groove element. Like, Oh, what if we did this thing that Slipknot did right here? And we started kind of introducing like a little bit of the new metal influences. And that was around the time that we were really touring heavy. Like when I say heavy, we were touring a lot uh, for nobody, um, like we would play if we had 50 people at a show it was the best show of the tour kind of thing. And how did you get on them tours? Were you doing them themselves or you how to like, like, let's go, like, let's get real deep on this. Obviously people tour, but how did you get on your first tours? First tour we did was with a band called denouncer from Florida. And it literally was just like, we both found each other on band camp and thought the stuff we wrote was cool and went on a tour. That was October, 2013. And then through connections of friends, our second tour was actually the wrong way tour with rotting out, no bragging rights, the beautiful ones in heart to heart. 
I remember that tour. So we ended up getting on the second half of that. And literally we were just like, we just want to play the shows. You don't got to literally the first five shows we did because heart to heart dropped off after that. We didn't get paid. We literally like, we don't care. We just want to play the shows. So we went out fucking stupid, stupid business mentality at that point, but we weren't a part of the tour. We just wanted to prove ourselves. I didn't know what I, every mistake that you need to, to make to learn how to tour properly. I, we made in a two week span, like absolutely everything touring in a conversion van that barely had a working transmission, not knowing what to price our merch at or how much to order. Uh, I think I ordered small through XL and ordered 25 of each because that's just what I thought you were supposed to do. Like just selling, just no idea what we were doing really and truly, but we made some good friends, you know, beautiful ones, guys were them and rotting out both like kind of looked out for us in those. They didn't have to, but they were super kind and like tried to give us little subtle coaching tips along the way. It's like, Hey, you should the do beautiful this ones gave you guys tips. Get the fuck out. I know. I know Get the they, fuck. Dude, we locked our keys in the van. And at this point, I think it was like a contest of between them and rotting out to see who was grimier, but they were both just surrounding our van, trying to find a break in point. And they slid this little tiny window and stuck Jimmy in up to his waist with a nightstick so he could pop the door open. And they were like, yeah, we did it. It was like a victory for the beautiful ones team. But, um, but yeah, that one was just like luck of connection and also eager and willing and just really just having the right people being like, okay, yeah, we'll just make sure you're like considered one of the locals for each show. I don't think we were even on the flyer that got posted, but we just made our own and, ran with it. And after that, um, we just started booking our own tours because that's the only way we could do it. So we booked our own tour with a band called heretic. After that, we booked our own tour. Um, we did our own little, like a solo, just us down to Florida and back. Cause we still hadn't played Florida to this point. Um, end of 2015, we did get asked to play with knocked loose on their first tour to the West coast. Uh, and that was, was that through for- Travis Porter or just through the band? Oh Yeah. That was to Travis Porter. The band wanted us, but um, our first Louisville show ever actually was uh, us, another mistake, and then Knocked Loose opened. And that was before we'd done our first tour back in 2013. <clears throat> and then they asked us to play with them and another mistake in 2015. And that tour was special. That was definitely, to this day, probably one of the coolest tours we've done because we got to really watch knock loose kind of realize oh shit we should have booked a bigger room like we were at me tyler were short and the basis of orthodox is my best friend zachariah would literally have to link arms between brian and the drum so he wouldn't get thrown through the kit every night and uh from there it was just we just kept booking our own shit after that we played a show did a, a tour left behind and at that point we kind of realized like damn the hardcore scene we've made a lot of friends in the hardcore scene, but like we realized more and more, like we aren't though. We love hardcore music. That wasn't like what we grew up on. And that's kind of when we started writing uh, what became the record sounds of loss. And we kind of just said, you know, we've been trying to write hardcore songs and make that take off for a while, but it's just not working. And so we just decided let's write whatever the fuck we genuinely want to write. And what came out was a pretty, heavily new metal influenced record. And that's kind of where our sound shifted and it caught on and it was the most fun we'd ever had writing or playing anything. And so we just kind of stuck with that and pushed that envelope. And that's how we got to where we are now. All right. Now this is something I think is cool. that You just admitted to a lot of people don't realize younger, younger versions of ourselves want to do bands. We want people to like us because of absolutely because of the, the way the internet moves no one wants to just say that so you go through this phase where you're like i just want to play something i don't care so you basically found yourselves in a situation where you like what you're doing but you want to do something more true to yourself and at the time i think you're right with the timing the metallic stuff is way more accessible to a kid who grew up listening to slipknot Yep. And say someone listening to, for me, I, 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 I said it a million times, sorry to all the listeners. Everything started at old, old, old metal because my mom got us into metal. So 
thrash metal, hair metal became, well, classic rock became hair metal, became thrash metal, became black metal and death metal, which led into mm-hmm. hardcore. It's hard to get a kid to listen to Slipknot to give a fuck about the brand brains. I mean, I, yeah. I know they're, I know they're, they're, I know there's their influence on the first 10 years of hardcore, but I don't put Bam Brands home put on and go, this is the greatest hardcore band. Now, I'll also accuse the same kind of bands that you play in of not actually listening to shit like the Age of Quarrel and some of the most classic hardcore stuff because all you really do need to do on super on the social media is, is say something new metal, then you've got all these cool people, girls, everyone's quoting you like, oh, you're the coolest band. And I feel like sometimes when the metallic stuff hits with the younger hardcore kids, they almost like flaunt and, flaunt and abscond from wanting to at least know about the hardcore shit because they see the balance of like, oh, well, I, you know, and and I say this where a picture from 1996 just popped up with me with a corn shirt on. So, you know, hell yeah, I see them bands. I see them tones. I see that shit, but I knew they weren't hardcore bands. Mm-hmm. And so I, I wonder how you guys navigate the space of being an active hardcore band, but playing a very metallic approach to it, which is very modern and now accepted. But where do you guys land on some of the classic stuff? Like, I, like, and the things I just brought up, like, what, what are your thoughts on all that? Man, it's, I think another thing a lot of people are scared to admit is like, Oh, I, I was not like a classic hardcore person. It was not something that it, it wasn't something that was, like you in said, you. like it Mad Ball. Yeah. yeah, Mad Ball literally played here for the first time. I pl- I played a show with Mad Ball in New York before I saw them in Nashville. Like that's how not accessible that was to us. So the the older stuff, you know, I've I've gone back and listened to it just to do almost to do my due diligence of like paying respect to what the fuck I'm listening to. But you know, and this is not to give any kind of disrespect to anyone, but if I'm choosing between listening to foundation or buried alive, I'm going to listen to foundation. Cause that's what I grew up on. And that's not to say that buried alive isn't kick fucking ass. It just means that's just not what I was, was into. And so in that, um, I think that in terms of navigating the heart. So one thing that's funny is the youngest member of our band, Austin, he's 23, him and our, drummer mike mike white he is, is the same into- austin who was in that crazy band from indiana no that's austin you're talking about the singer of no victory yeah no not that Austin. Oh, that kid's austin. fucking crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah you can't you but, can't uh, be in a band with that maniac i was i was in purgatory for a little while so i spent a lot of time <laughs> with that austin so All right. All right. um but uh but no our, our austin austin evans he is savant level talented guitarist and the ironic thing is like i said he's the youngest of all of us and he is just dies into all things origin basically when i say origin not the band but like the i love like the opening i love it. i love and, what I love. and the band origin sick as fuck by the way ex- yeah exactly <laughs> and it's it's funny because another person who's that exact same way is isaac hale from knock loose and he i mean when they were writing their first records he was literally like listening to everything that was out 15 years before he was born. He's, he's all of them know so much about the early catalogs of hardcore that makes what is today. And it's just things that like, I personally wasn't listening to. And it's not to say that I don't greatly appreciate it and enjoy it. It's just not something I ever dove deep into. So in terms of navigating that, I think that's a part of the reason why we've been able to establish the sound we do is because you have, we're very true to exactly what we like. And so we're not trying to mimic anyone. We're trying to pay, like pay an homage to different bands of different times. I think Austin's favorite band of like that era is like Chimera. That's okay. like his, that's his shit. And you can kind of hear that here and there when you listen to us. But I, I also don't really that's like the ironic thing of us like playing. This is hardcore. It's like, I don't, we're all very hardcore minded people. We tour like a hardcore band where we have the grit. We have all of the, the, the tools and morals that go along with being a touring hardcore band. But musically, I, I don't think we're a hardcore band. Now, and when you say that, why do you say that? 
I think it's because I grew up listening. Like my first hardcore show was Casey Jones and we sound absolutely fucking nothing like that. And I think that also kind of goes into the whole hardcore is a free flowing subjective genre to where like, you know, never ending. You mentioned never ending game. That band to me would not have sounded like a hardcore band. When I first started listening to hardcore music, I would have attributed them more to like Metallica. And, but that is, it, everything has become more and more of like, I think what makes a hardcore band a hardcore band now is almost more your live reaction and how you perform versus the actual music itself. Because another one, Vane is not a hardcore band, but you you absolutely, they are, but they, at the same exact time, <clears throat> you'd be crazy to say they aren't because you watch them perform, you watch where they came from. It's you can't say that they're not. So it's like so let's let's pull this one back. We're gonna okay. pull the thread. Hold on, sir. Ready? We're gonna do this, Sean, real quick. Let's circle back to that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a country music guy, family mm-hmm. embedded in country music. Country music came from folk music. Folk music came from the earliest settlers of the country playing music and the developing like rhymes and limericks into songs, mel- early melodies. And deeper in the South, they have different juke joints would had their own rhythm to it. You know, um, depending on the different small areas of the South, not even including Texas, just the South, there's varying degrees of things that would happen. Kentucky, Pennsylvania, we were really banjo laden because of just the influence of that instrument and is still seen in a lot of stuff. I always say that the problem with hardcore today is that rock and roll in the 1940s wasn't even really established. It was like almost like swing music and cabaret singers. Mm -hmm. What the fuck was rock and roll in 1980? So we're in a shift. We're in a paradigm shift of Mm -hmm. We can't expect every young band to try to sound like the 1979, 1980s, although it seems to be very uh, serviced. I was uh, the word the right term is actually that terminology and that focus seems to be used a lot by publicists and lazy journalism to describe bands who just play fast as, oh, they're bringing back the old sound as I know they're not. Yep. And then, you got to also remember is there's so many crazy bands of the first generation of hardcore, like the mad and stuff that were just weird art people who wrote shit to piss everybody off. Yep. That what I'm building to is that hardcore. There are bands that are completely by sound hardcore. There Mm -hmm. are bands that are completely hardcore by not only genre definition of what the band does, the way they perform, the social community that they evolve themselves in, and the overall goals of a hardcore band. But at the very same time, there's always been outlying bands that have always brought in metal. And the the influence of metal is so deafening the more you listen to stuff. And then when you get into the deep history, why all the first generation hardcore bands thought they could get bigger if they played a little bit more metal and most of them failed completely at it, that it's impossible if we're being honest to not own own up to the fact that metal's influence overshadowed punk's influence within time. And that's why the um, the divergence and the deference to call it hardcore, not hardcore punk started to become a thing. And that's why there's bands that are loyal to a completely different subset of bands that stay within the hardcore punk. And so today I would say that as we are in 44 years of hardcore music, that it's not a shock to me in any single way that a band like yours would play operate business-wise more like a hardcore band, play shows that are both more in the metal realm when the tour is there, but you guys are still hardcore and not be able to find the definition because by proxy, defining hardcore depends upon your own personal subset. And then also Mm -hmm. because the internet, you've got to be subjected to dickheads like me, Mm -hmm. Bob Wilson and stuff, who will decide (laughs) if you're hardcore or not by our own stupidity. 
So you're in a bad spot here, kid. You know, I think that it's cool to own up to the influence that you have. I think that bands who operate with the mindset of whatever it is we're going to get to in the next question, what you know, the drive of the band and the focus, I think you're in a blurred place because sonically the kids today don't really give a fuck if it doesn't sound like a breakdown demo or it doesn't sound like a mad ball record. Although those things would get you points. There is a shit ton of kids that never heard the 87 breakdown, breakdown demo. They don't know who raw deal is and they couldn't tell you that raw deal is also killing time because their world is something different. I think that that's where you're kind of lodged in. So for me, obviously we you've played some shows for us. The, the sound is completely separated from that world but you're still operating in this, you know, you're not, you're not grandstanding yet. You don't have the big fucking scribs. You don't got the light show. You're nowhere near um, Romstein level production here. So you're still in the hardcore vein, so to speak. I'm glad you're being honest, but I, I would say that this is the hardest problem that we face in hardcore today is the, is it a sound or is it motivation? And this gets to the next thing, obviously, you brought it up way earlier. Carl, Carl Severance is really, uh, I always fuck his last name up because I'm retarded. But Carl from Nora, Carl from Ferret, or just Jersey Carl, whatever you call him, that guy has been involved in hardcore forever. Before there was a core associated with metal core. He's done all this crazy stuff. He believes in your fucking band. We, you know, and I also, I'm, I'm kind of one of these people that think that. There isn't enough people pushing straight edge. <laughs> there's never enough people pushing straight edge and hardcore. I don't think there's enough messages. And I don't have the affinity for just random metal bands the way other people do. Or, oh, let's take a chance. Because I I know you do shows. I know the people who you do shows for. You know, like, mm -hmm. I know that you work your ass off in your town to do hardcore shows. So when he said, hey, like, how do you feel about Orthodox? I'm like, what do they want to play the fest? <laughs> like to me, I don't I don't ask certain bands because sound wise, you guys might want scribs. You guys might want that stand to stand up so you put your one leg up. <laughs> you know, like I don't know what you guys want. So unless you guys come knocking on the door, I don't want to <laughs> last thing I want to do is a bunch of metal kids from Nashville like fuck your fest, you know. So you know, you guys got in the door here <clears throat> because of the shows that you played here, the fact that I know that you do shows, the fact that Carl is one of my boys and was like, yo, these guys are the legit thing. And again, we put, I mean, you guys played that you guys played that show with Kubicon here. That was fucking insane. You know, you guys came here and played the church with varials, you know, like these are the things that stick with me, but I never going to approach a band. I'm like, you should play this hardcore. Like it becomes kind of like you either take the path of, we want to play this hardcore or one of the people that are taking your money they want you to play this hardcore, you know, <laughs> and that gives us my next thing. Where does, <clears throat> where does a band like yours go? Like, where does it go? Does it go to barricades and buses and bitches and money? Or does it, <laughs> does it stay in the, does it stay in the streets? Like, wh like, where do you even like, as you're building this thing? Cause obviously you're a very intelligent person, super articulate. You really, you were raised in the music industry. So no matter what, you can always going to find a place there, but like, what the fuck are you going to do with this band? Like, what are you trying to take? Where are you trying to take this band? I think it kind of goes back to, like I said before, like my original goals for this band were so, were surpassed so long. Like my original thing when I started singing for a band was like, I think it'd be so cool if somebody knew my words and sang along to the song. Like that was like my first goal. And the more and more we've gone, you know, we got to play, an edge day in Atlanta with foundation and shit like that. That was another goal. I like got to cross off a lot of really cool opportunities. And I think at this point, I'm kind of mixed between like, so the tour we're announcing tomorrow is um, us chamber momentum, one, five, six silence and sell. So it's a very like kind of a mix between metallic hardcore and metal bands and who's the metal bands when i say metal i mean like metal core metal adjacent with cell one five six saying that a chamber. word on this podcast oh my, my mistake <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> the uh essentially the goal with that is like 
we haven't done a headliner in, in forever and it's been literally five years and we are, we deliberately were like, we just want to play crazy shows. So we, we told every promoter, put us in the smallest room that you think makes sense. And we just want, we just essentially want to have a great time playing these shows with other bands that we feel have been pretty overlooked over time for different touring opportunities. And so that's kind of like the first goal I've got right now is to do well enough on that so that we have enough opportunities to where if a bus tour calls, we can take it. If we get a call from terror, we can take it. If we get a call, we, we don't really, in terms of where I see this band going or the direction I want to take it is I just want to work. That's kind of just where I'm at is like, I don't care what the job is. If it makes sense for us to do it, then we'll do it. You know, we just came off of, um, we did that varials tour with varials and boundaries and it was absolutely lots of breakdowns, lots of lots breakdowns. of breakdowns. Oh yeah. And it was amazing. It was a great, it was one, it was the tour where we realized that we were gaining a little bit of steam from our new record. And then we went and did a tour with Gideon and for the fallen dreams back in February, and March. And we did even better on that tour. And so it's kind of like, a, we have found a sound within ourselves that I can honestly say is pretty in modern terms, pretty unique to ourselves. There's not a lot of bands that sound like us and we're finding ways to fit in on pretty much any show because it's, I kind of, to your point is hardcore is subjective to who is naming it. And though sonically we stand out on a show with, dead guy on our performance performance level we can be perceived as a hardcore band at a hardcore show or a metal core band at a hardcore show and still do a good job or we can be on a tour with gideon who's like a legitimate metal core band and be perceived as like hey, let's just weird... take the let's just take the core away from them sure they let's but just, we can be i'm taking it back off of them they're just a metal <laughs> I, hey, they would love that. But uh, <laughs> let me uh, let me break this while you. I know you're a mid stride here. You know, uh, I just had Carl Earthquake on the podcast, mm -hmm. and all the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland straight edge people who were trying to bring back 1988 and 1995 and six accused Earth Crisis of sounding like a metal band, and I want you to take that perspective. Okay, I don't just answer on this. So Destroy the Machines, if you listen to it, if you listen to it now versus then, when I was a kid, I'm like, this is fucking hardcore. Mm -hmm. I put that shit on on the drive home from work to get ready for my car Earth Crisis interview. And I'm like, yo, this is 100% a fucking metal record. <laughs> <laughs> if the lens is the 87 demo, if the, if the lens is Start Today by Gorilla Biscuits, if the lens is... The Youth of the Day catalog. Yeah. That's a fucking metal record. But who the fuck in the world is going to say Earth Crisis is in a hardcore band? Exactly. And it's so, the same. So, yeah. And so this is the paradigm shift where the things that happen in hardcore are based upon the connection to a culture. So when you say, yeah, we get to play with Dead Guy, it's like Dead Guy didn't even know where they wanted to belong. They had shirts that say Death mm -hmm. to False Metal, but they didn't really... I guess they were metal. Like there was Dillinger the Escape Plan. Those motherfuckers. There's a ton of metallic Carl's bands and the bands Carl's were involved in. Like those guys really took metal further. Mm -hmm. So when Dead Guys were, I'm like, ah, that's still a little hardcore. And Tim Singer being so deep into uh, between his old bands and his old zine. Like here's a guy who did everything in the '88 Straight Edge days, and then in the mid '90s went ahead and became I want to be evil and metal and you're like nah this is a Baphomet on there it's not really that metal you know like hmm. but the presentation to <clears throat> 90s people are like this is so fucking metal depending on the lens depending on the observation and then the individual listener so I, I think that you got to keep this in mind that when you guys play you're going to have a lot of them older cats and a lot of people who are older who want to see these bands Blown the fuck away that someone like your band is presenting something in a hardcore way like this, but being fucking completely metallic. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. I hope you're right. 
<laughs> I'm never I, wrong. I, I believe it. I, uh, I, I definitely, I think that was kind of the cool thing about when we got like, you know, this, this is hardcore lineup. And then also like the furnace fest offer and so on is like, we've got a sound that can definitely skip over generations and, and get to people that were involved way before we were, and they would still appreciate it because it reminds them of, like you said, <clears throat> earth crisis at the time where the lens wasn't there, but they were kind of breaking that ground. And see, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a very, I think one of the coolest things, I guess, in terms of the direction that we want to go is that like, we're finding that the more true to ourselves we stick, the further we're able to take things because I would say each record kind of has gotten weirder and weirder and more, I wouldn't say niche cause that sounds almost negative, but a little more and more into our own execution. And yes. I think that, I think that the more that we lean into that, the better things are getting. And sometimes I, I think sometimes taking the scary risks and doing things that aren't popular in the moment pay off in dividends down the line. And hopefully that's the situation with us because we're kind of pushing an envelope. Like, like you said, where are you going to take this band? And it's like, we just, it's like I said, we don't really have any, any like in goal. Like, obviously if we got to go on a tour with Slipknot, duh, but like I at mean, the exact might same be time, easier than you think these days. Arenas are pretty hard to book, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you don't have to fill them. They do. You just got to show up first. Yeah. the, I guess my point being that we would jump on that tour just as quickly as like one of the bands that's left of in terms of like the personal legacy for me that I would die to tour with is comeback hit. Like 100% would kill Man, the, they would on the, tour, love with the them. tour with you guys. They've been playing with all these goofball uh, bar rock bands lately. They would love to Man, have you guys on a tour like that. I would love to, you want to talk about me getting out and hurting myself by the end of a tour, put me, put me on a couple of dates with the comeback kid. Cause that's just, that is like that band from that era for Carl, me. Carl, get on it. Carl. Oh, he was, he was, he was hollering at him oh, last summer. He was, he was bugging him about it. I think they were doing dates with, um, with end and yeah, uh, misery signals. That. You should have been on that. I appreciate that. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's my point is that we're, we're kind of at a point where we all love such a, such a wide array of things that like another tour, like all in the same vein, we'd stand out a little bit, but like, we're really good friends with like the Lorna shore guys. Our, our basis is literally like their they got breakdowns, guy. right? Oh, do they? You got yeah. breakdowns. So where are you standing? Exactly. Now? Well, just the fact that I'm not a guttural vocalist and we're not like you a, don't need to. We, they got we're breakdowns. not a symphonic. That's to my point. Exactly. So we can, <laughs> we can fit in just about anywhere because we can convey our execution and performance with confidence. And I think that's why we just, I, I, I think that's why it's so hard for me to answer this question is because I have no fucking idea where we're going to end up. Want me to tell you the, and the, when we tell you the answer is you go for it. Know. You don't know. No one knows. Yeah. I, and I, but I, <laughs> I yeah, just want to see even... where I wanted to see how you pulled it off because for me, the, the way that this works out is how hard you push something. There's the imposter mm -hmm. syndrome in everybody. There's the worry. There's a, the thrill of victory and the fear that the agony of defeat will come crashing in. But the experiences you put on yourself and you learn and the shit that you acquire along the way on these tours it, 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 and the mind that you have and the direction that you've already been put in, th these are all learning lessons that you're going to put to something. Even if it's not this band, it'll be the mm -hmm. next thing that you do. For me, yep. for me, uh, going back to it again, when you were talking about the way that you sound and all this and what's not popular, 2014 Code Orange and Twitching Tongue sounded very different from TUI and from a lot of the stuff that was also very popular in the hardcore scene. And then something like Code does the, we're going to take it a little bit a step further. Everybody got nervous. Because code got a little weird, but now Candy's trying to be a little bit weird. Vane's implementing more weird. The bold always get beaten up by people for being like, "Why are you getting out of line with what's cool?" Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna tell you what, Twitching Tongues, man, they put out a fabulous fucking record. 
and then they went for it on other records musically. And I don't think people are ready for them. And now seeing the response from them saying return, I think kids now are more open to stuff like this, which is where you see the popularity of Twitter. Oh yeah. Resurge where you see the popularity of this stuff because of all the things that we've touched on. So I don't want you to go into this being like, well, I don't know how we're going to work it out. It's like the kids today are always going to be a little bit more wide open. And, and the old heads that come to hardcore shows now, and this is the cheat code for you. If I had a dollar for every hardcore dude who's my age or older, who wasn't going to shows when I first started going to shows, they came like much later than me. I'd be a lot richer because there's a ton of guys <laughs> that found hardcore. They're my age, but they weren't going to shows when we were. And that doesn't, mm-hmm. the, the pecking order of when you went to shows isn't so much important as old heads tend to also listen to very metallic shit. And I know tons of people in their 30s and 40s who found hardcore later, tons of hardcore people who had the prerequisites that you did, the the slip knots and such, and then they found their way back to hardcore. So I don't want you to feel so out of place, you know, And and I think that your head's in the right spot. How do you feel as a band? Not some, we won't shit on Carl, but we're going to attack management or attack some booking agent. Do you see it as a necessary evil? Do you see it as something that's the, like a gatekeeping in itself where bands who don't use it, don't get to go far. And, and because you're music, music industry minded from your background and your child, your family, how do you work all this out in your head to like have these other people involved in the process that brings your band from where you're at now to where you're trying to go? I think that it's a, Double side, it's kind of a double edged sword because <clears throat> they are, like you said, necessary evil, so to speak. Um, I think that what becomes difficult is that obviously the biggest bands out there are going to have your agents. They're going to be, and it makes sense for the bands that are that are really that need a CPA that need to be keeping track of every every number along the way that they would have an agent because it's a lot to handle the issue becomes that with modern technology, Spotify, um, anybody can own a record label kind of mentality. You have such a a vast oversaturation of the market that I guarantee, and this is not any kind of diss on any band that's getting the slots on these tours, but it's like, I look at so many tours and I know my band sells more tickets than the bands on these tours. But the difference is having representation or an agent in those times that is pushing favors. your name across the table favors favors helps and it's not even <laughs> it's not even i'm not dissing you i just this is my this is my shit so you're going along yeah. with how i feel it, it it's not even necessarily pulling favors as it is winning favor of people because i know um your your buddy rich hall um yeah. i met him when we were on in uh tacoma on that uh on that gideon tour and talking with him for half an hour, you know, that was one of those connections where I'm like, man, I'm glad that I have the favor of this individual. Not that he owes me anything, but it's just when you network and, and find ways to like gain genuine connections with people, that gets you really far when it's the right people. But he was to that exact big, point, he was a real big advocate to get you on the fest as well. That is a yeah, fact. And, yeah. And, and, and I remember the conversation. Uh, what do you think about Orthodox? <laughs> That's my exactly. Boy. And, and you have those rare opportunities where, you know, to give Carl the credit, Rich would not have gone to that show had Carl not told him you need to go see this fucking band. So there, that's where Carl comes in handy because otherwise who knows if we get the offer or not. And in that, it's also just, it's kind of hard to get the true attention of the, agents who do owe the favors or who are in favor of other bands because they go back with this other guy and so on and so forth. So though it is a little bit of a bummer here and there to have to need that additional help with an agent, with a manager, so on and so forth. If you have the people that are doing their job, you're never mad about paying the check. And that's kind of how I've always looked at it is that like, as long as someone's bringing me opportunities I have to look at it as like, you know, it's kind of like a server at a restaurant. 
you tip the server because they do you a service. They bring you food. It's not that you can't cook on your own, but they are the vessel that brings you the meal. They are the people who bring you the experience. They bring you the opportunity to enjoy that. And so you have to pay them to enjoy that situation. And it's the same situation with management and agents is that like, if my agent isn't doing his job, if my manager's not doing their job, we're going to have a conversation, but Speaking if of, they're doing a church a, right now. I'm loving it. If, if they're exactly, <laughs> if they're bringing you opportunities, if they're getting your foot in the door somewhere, then you absolutely owe them your fucking money because you wouldn't have made anything to give them 10, 15% anyways, if they hadn't got you that opportunity. And I think a lot of people get upset about, oh, well, you shouldn't have to pay your manager for this tour because you're friends with that band. They would have asked you to tour anyways. Like, yeah, but uh, think about all the other records. Think stuff. about all. You might be friends with a band, but everybody's friends. The money gets on the table. And but to my point is you don't realize how much work a manager does that doesn't bring money in. It's just moving the train along that he doesn't get compensated for. That's hours and hours of work that there's nothing to pay him with. So he has nothing to commission. So that's why you commission your agent, and your manager on every tour regardless. And that's kind of the, again, that's that double-edged sword of like, Oh, we probably would have gotten this opportunity, but Carl's been busting his absolute ass for us outside of this. So of course we're going to pay Carl. Adam Lolke, our agent um, has been booking this headliner. He's a, a much newer agent to the degree where when I was taking a call with him, I was, 100%, 100% ready to be like, hey, I've been doing this for 10 years. Who do you know that I don't? That was like what my mentality was going to be to start that interview of like, what can you bring that me and Carl can't find on our own? And he flipped it immediately and was like, hey, you need to do a fucking headliner. It's been too long. And started talking to me about all these plans right off the rip. And I was like, cool, you're our guy. And he's been busting his ass to get this book for us. And so, of course, I'm like, you, if, you, if somebody's doing the job for you and they're doing it well, you're excited to give them what they vote, what what they've earned. And that's, that's kind of my take on it is that it's a necessary evil in the sense that like, it, depending on where your level of success you want to get to is like, if all you want to do is tour and play garages, you don't need it. And that's sick. If that's your goal, fucking rip it up. But if you want to get up there and start playing with the likes of, you know, integrity, earth crisis, you know, the Acacia strain, knock loose, all these bigger bands that have been doing it for a long time and have that representation, then it really helps to just have them pushing your name because everybody's name is out there. So what are you going to do if you're not the hot new band to get your name in front of someone? And that's where that, that person helps a lot. Do you feel like Twitter and the conversations complaining about merch cuts are a way to go to the plebs, the fans and say, look at we're punk rock. We don't want to pay the merch cut yet. They got the manager. They got the booking agent. They got the publicist. It kind of, I always break balls about this point, but I love to hear it from your perspective based upon your previous answer, because I think that you understand the devils in the details and that the same bands that do this kind of stuff do actually gain more from playing this kind of stuff the way that they're doing it. Go for that. Take that on. Take that on. <laughs> <laughs> so here's how I view the merch cut is. There are certain situations where a merch cut is actually a valid expense. If you have a really big promotional budget or you're paying your ass out in catering, or there's a big production cost, or you have to staff the venue and there's other expenses that that merch cut brings. I think then you, you can, you can justify your reason for going to take the money. However, if I'm playing a venue like the end in Nashville, which is where I book all the time. It is a 250 cap room. Um, there's no production cost. The room is inexpensive to book. And I've already agreed upon what I'm going to pay that band. So in that situation, if I don't have any additional expenses or staff that I need to give them what they're owed, I don't see why people, I think at, that's the point where the merch cut is kind of bullshit in my mind. Is that? Well, actually, I think we're taking it different ways. I was saying is, I find that the bands that benefit from managers and booking agents and all this other stuff are willing to pay for that. But then they go to Twitter and complain about merch cuts. It's like, you're already in what I call the pro core world. So why are you bitching sure. about now? Uh, that's why are you bitching about a 
agreed upon part of the pro core world. And I don't see that much from guys like you. And there is a bunch of bands like yours that have managers, have booking agents. You obviously know the in, ins and outs of this music thing. Yet I don't see you jumping in there and be like, God, another merge cut. This is fucking terrible. And I kind of like that because I think you kind of realize you got to pay a booking agent for all the reasons we just talked about. I like that you're not out there saying, yeah, me too. I also hate merge cuts. By the way, I mean, this, I hardcore, do... this hardcore 100% doesn't do merge cuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm i going to, I'll go on the record to say I do hate merge cuts. I do think that uh, if I'm a band that's bringing people to your venue, you should have other revenue and, and avenues to profit off the people that are coming to the venue versus taking something from my band when you didn't even supply me a table. That's kind of where I, I'm like, eh, I think that's bullshit. Wait, no but tables? I'm also, that's a wild if, move. If they don't get, yeah. Yo, no so, table, no cut. Yeah, and, but I also am aware that in a lot of venues where, or on a lot of tours where there are merch cuts, I'm getting an opportunity to play in front of a lot of people that may not that's have heard of us before. Pro. So that's the quid pro quo that they're missing. And that's, yeah. So, like, yeah, it fucking sucks. But I'll tell you another thing that's huge that a lot of people don't do is because we're all, a, a lot of us are, you know, born and bred, going, going to these heavy shows, and there's such a negative and aggressive feeling against merch cut i feel like there's almost like this social pressure to like be a total dick to the venue staff when you know you're gonna get a merch cut dude we've played multiple live nation shows where we show up we shake hands we're nice to the staff we talk with them like they're people if they have a problem we try to help them fix it and vice versa and they don't merch rate us and it's like if you're just a human being to another human being you can usually get out of the true number, they'll be a lot more likely to take your flub number that every band is giving them. And you're not fooling them. They know that you're lying about what you sold or that sometimes they don't even do it because you've just been so kind to them. They don't want to take it. And I feel like because we're all so quick to put our shoulders up and say, fuck you, you're not taking my merch cut. That kind of then causes a confrontation or a point of contention to where they feel they have to put their shoulders up and say, no, we are. So I feel like the best kind of piece of advice I could give to any band that's starting to get into that world is just, you're not, I've said this before. It's like, we're all playing hardcore shows. We're not shit. You want to talk about like Taylor Swift just sold out three nights at Nissan or Nissan stadium. That's 180,000 tickets. We are not shit. So don't come in there with an ego because a couple of kids on Twitter think your band is sick and, and like just, just to be nice to the people who are providing you a space to, to perform your art. And that will go so much further than you can even imagine because the venue staff is going to be happy to see you the next time you roll around. And maybe at the end of the night, they're not going to take the full 15 to 20%. They're willing to take the $20 bill, the $50 bill you hand them when they know that you technically owe them more because you're signed a contract about it. It's it, it, human decency and sometimes swallowing your pride and biting your tongue goes a lot further than you think. Couldn't agree more. I think it's all about relationships and the way that people handle them are going to get you a lot further in life than trying to stunt on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, you are a newer band to a lot of people that will be coming to this hardcore. And since mm -hmm. we are in the this is hardcore promo track, I've never done this with the podcast where we push some of the bands that are lesser known, but I think it's an important part of a having a podcast and be having a fest named after the podcast or via op opposite fest who became a podcast, we need to talk about if you were to suggest one or two songs to someone to really check out, like if you're like, all right, man, if you want to check my band out, this is the song I really want you to listen to. What do you think one song could win over someone in, in, in the This Is Hardcore universe? Ooh. Hard. Hard decision. Yeah, because my like music business brain is like, push the new record and... <laughs> <laughs> but I also know that like live, some of our older songs are the ones that just go nuts. Um, all right. I would say one of the more unique sounding songs that I think really kind of, it travels across a lot of different genre influence, but nothing feels out of place is our song head on a spike. Um, I think that, that song 
it kicks in with a genuine like death metal driven heavy tremolo double kick spot that goes into a really bouncy almost deathcore sounding metal break that goes into an undeniably new metal chorus and then it's got a thrash riff right after that that then goes into in my opinion one of the coolest groovy like baggy pant ass breakdowns ever like austin really whooped ass on that one and it, it's just it's a really cool song that i think encompasses all of our um influences all at once uh and showcases it really well and then it also is it's just absolute just car wreck heavy it, it is truly i would say the heaviest song we've ever written so that's another kind of cool point to it do you feel being on this is hardcore is going to elevate you within the hardcore crowd or just something that you kind of say, well, we did it and it was cool, but we got to move on to X, Y, and Z. I think you can be that, honest. You can't, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, my hope is that it does obviously like I would anytime you can, especially because like I said, I've, I all through my teen years, saw that this is hardcore festivals. I could never afford to find a way to get up there, but I've always admired the lineups, always watched the videos. So like to play it in and of itself is a really cool, just to be there and be a part of it is really cool to me to be on the flyer. is really cool to me. And I think that a lot of people in the modern hardcore world haven't given us much of the time of day because a lot of the people that are getting involved now only really started getting involved right when we were starting to really play the metalcore type stuff, the metalcore deathcore circuits. And so they don't know about us or what we do or where we're from. So I think that that'll, I think, I think the, what I can hope is that this is hardcore wins us over a lot of fans who would have liked us if they listened to us a long time ago. And if not that, then we'll at least have a lot of fans that are older than me at the next time we come around. I think a good way to wrap this one up is going to ask you because you've been doing this for almost 10 years and because you do have a smart mind towards uh, music business. I find myself with a lot of friends who toured for a lot of years, getting that really grassroots experience, but moving on. Is that something that you've brought forward to your like, Oh shit, I think I'm going to end up being a manager or booking agent of some kind or because of the, your parents and the background that you're trying to avoid that. Man. So my career when I'm home is I'm a realtor. Um, that's, that's why you talk so well and got the cool hair. <laughs> Fuck yeah. I, uh, I started working in real estate about a year ago and that was kind of like a, I want to be able to help people do something that makes a genuine impact in their life. And also it's a career that allows me the time to take for my full-time metal band. Um, and I bet it sells you some, uh, I bet it sells you some houses when you say, Oh yeah, I'm also in a band. And then you're like, damn, this is a cool realtor. It, it's kind of funny every now and then, like anytime that I go to a first meeting with a client, I make sure like long sleeves, you know, don't, you don't know who this person is. You don't know how they feel about anything. So like, don't lean too hard into anything aside from just being a friendly person. But a couple of times then I'll start telling like, yeah, no, I'm a touring musician for a metal band. And I'm like, if you listen to it, you're not going to believe it's me. Uh, so have fun. That's like, that's a pretty funny part in the relationship. But um, in terms of management and so on, I like to make the joke that I kind of pseudo, pseudo manage some of my friends' bands that don't have representation because, like I said, I've, if I've done anything with Orthodox, it is make a lot of mistakes that I could, I've learned from. And you know. I think that if I'm not able to – I never want to overstep and be like, hey – don't do that because I did this. I never want to be the guy to like force myself on something, but I, I feel like I've made enough relationships along the way to where people come to me a lot for advice on like, Hey, if we're doing like a friend of mine, who's in a, my, my buddy um, who sings for this amazing band from Atlanta called deal with it. They're like a true, in my mind, like cool rendition of a punk hardcore band. I just, I and, just listened to them again today. Cause I saw someone post about them. They're sick. It's a it's a literal like punk hardcore band that uses an HM2, but it it all makes sense. He hit me up asking about like, you know, how should we go about releasing this? Would you recommend this, that, and the other? And it's like Luke doesn't need my fucking help. Luke's a smart dude. He books a lot of shows in Atlanta. He knows how this shit goes. But 
to be able to be a person that people can come to me to figure out how, even if it's not how to do it the right way, it's how to avoid doing it the wrong way. I feel like that's all that a manager is, is really until you can get the connections, like having 30 years in the industry, like Carl has, it's really, it's, it's steering somebody to make the right choice on their own or giving them a little bit of a nudge or a little bit of advice to help them figure out where to go next. And that's, that's kind of what I try to do for a lot of my friends bands when they're willing, just because I've been doing it for as long as I have. And in that, I found that I genuinely enjoy working in the industry, but I don't, I I've, I've talked with Carl about getting into van management and I don't know that I'm there yet. I still feel like I, I have a few more hands to shake and a few more connections to make before I can really bring something more than experience to the table. And I want to make sure that if I'm representing a band, I can really bring them opportunities. And, but it's definitely to answer your question, it's definitely something that's on my mind. It's just also between doing this band, booking shows at home, being a real estate agent. I manage a couple of Airbnbs in Nashville and I work at a restaurant. I don't Sounds know that like I have time. Busy. Yeah. I, so at some point, if something, if my plate gets a little larger or something falls off of it, I definitely think that's the next step I'm going to take. But it's something right now where I don't want to start anything until I can give everything I've got to it. And I don't know that I've got that in the tank at the moment since I'm already putting it into other stuff. Man, that is a fucking awesome way to put everything into perspective. Listen, I didn't, I didn't know everything in the world about you. I, I had a lot of notes. I keep looking down on them, but we kind of got into such a cool, different world with it. And I think that the things to take away from this is that you are not only well-spoken, but you have your head on your shoulders. And a lot of people your age don't. They think I that, that they think that all they need is one record. And like you said, it's Taylor Swift time. And and the void the the vo- the chasm between true pure rock stardom financial freedom and the years it takes I mean very few bands get to do it and it's this Geico commercial guy oh you gotta be a little quicker than that and I see so many people <laughs> pulling themselves up to that up to that moment and there's that guy willing to do it that I love that your head's on your shoulders I, I, I'm I'm a heavy advocate for you now after having this conversation and um. We're going to post all your social media links and I just wish you guys the best of luck. And I'm going to be on side stage watching you with Carl, try to push the old guy off the stage, make him stage dive during your shit. Oh, please. <laughs> oh my God, please. <laughs> and, what uh, I would give. And uh, just keep things going. And, and I'd like to, I'd like to stay in touch just to uh, make sure that Nashville is getting the right highlights in, in, in hardcore in general, because there are a lot of places and, and we did tour them. Like I said, uh, you know, the Philly Memphis connection is a hundred percent a real thing. And we've got tons from all the uh, friends from all over these, these small areas that we're still cool with just because those were the warm welcoming places when punishment and shadow realm had toured. And mm-hmm. I love that you have such a pride in your area, regardless of its um, MySpace metal past. <laughs> yeah, and baby. I hear nothing but positive <laughs> things about all the shows in that area and good work on you being able to balance being in a band, all the real life shit, but also understanding what a hardcore bands needs first, what these metal shows need. And this is a great conversation. And just thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Sincerely. Is there any, uh, obviously I'll put the social medias out, but just, it's always good for someone to say like, ah, and all this, not that someone's writing it down in a car, but Mm-hmm. And that's what you're supposed to do. I think legally you can't be on the podcast without telling people your ads and all that stuff. Uh, in terms of plugs at Orthodox TN for, um, for our Instagram Orthodox TN as in Tennessee.com for merch videos, tour dates, everything. Um, mine is at steal this Adam kind of like steal this album from system of a down, but you know, swap the last word. Um, and if there's anything to, else to plug, uh, when is this coming out? Do you know? Whenever I want. I could put it out Friday. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of in charge of the situation. So that's sick. Well, yeah, literally. <laughs> and I, and I, I mean that sincerely. Like we've been getting a lot of podcasts. So 
I could put it out once a week, or if I get to the point where like, oh, I fuck to get all this out before the, the fest, I may start doing like one on a Friday, one on a Monday or Tuesday, because I like doing them. But at the same time, as I don't want to beat people over the head, so yeah. Um, only other thing for me to plug is we're announced tomorrow. What is tomorrow? May 9th. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It'll be after after you can you can announce it now. Yeah, yeah. It a couple we're days uh, we're we're dropping our first headliner since 2018 with a uh, chamber momentum 156 silence cell. Uh, it's called the fortune favors, the cold tour. And I'm unbelievably excited. And if you want to show up and tell me how fucking annoyed you were with me on this podcast, that's totally fine too. So by you the know, time you I, get to this is hardcore, Jordan Jenkins going to have you at least 40 pounds of straight muscle. You're not even going to have, I a hope neck. so. You're not God, even gonna have a neck I hope by the so. time that guy gets involved. Yeah, I just want to be all I want. I want to look like a set of shoulder pads, you know? <laughs> Listen, man, thank you for coming on the show. I loved our conversation and I'm looking forward to August and uh, good luck on your tour. Thank you, man. I hope to talk to you soon. Take care, dude. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Adam was a very well spoken person. The story of Orthodox has not yet been finished, and good luck to them on the road. Hopefully, if you are not a fan, you will at least go ahead and check them out. They uh, The links will be up on our podcast, T-I-H-E Podcast is the link, or just you know go to our social medias, you can check it out. Also, check them out at This Is Hardcore. i got to say that even though the show sold out. Um, again, tomorrow, 12 p.m., big announcement for us, and This Is Hardcore. Um, I'm not much of a person who likes to put specific private matters out but there's a longtime philadelphia hardcore friend who was actually even referenced in two or three separate podcasts i've done in last week and um if you believe in the power of providence or god himself or the lord almighty or allah whatever you you know choose to use as a deity put some prayers and good feelings in the world for our friend because he is hopefully going to recover and that's the best thing i could say about it so put some good energy into the air um get ready for spring to turn into summer lots of fucking fun shows there are still two-day tickets for this hardcore but i don't know how long they're gonna last and hopefully with this announcement more people get excited and we got a shit ton of philly hardcore shows and i told you earlier in the show but i'll say again phillyhcshows.com phcshows at instagram and twitter that's the easiest way to find us Thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, check us out on YouTube. I'm going to get the Andy King one up. I'm slower to get to the video because it takes longer to get to the editing. But the shit will be up. So check it out. Thank you for the support. I'm really happy how many people really enjoyed the last couple episodes. And I've been ripping and rolling. And we got a bunch more recorded. And hopefully enjoy the ones coming up. Take care.